Hello, friends, family, visitors, and guests of Framework Church. My name is Jason Blakey. I'm one of the pastors here at Framework Church, and we are so excited that you're joining us online for worship. You know, the whole country is beginning to open, and so are we. We actually have a few phases that we're going to be implementing in order to reopen our church. And so here's a video explaining some of those phases. Hey Framework, we just wanted to take the opportunity to check in with you and give you some updates of what's going on for the church and for the future and for the summer and openings. The first thing that we're excited to tell you is that we now are able to have small groups here at the church and actually had one this morning and started the first of the week. We'll be able to have groups up to sizes of 50. And we're excited about that. There'll be opportunities uh, for you to meet and have a chance to share together. We'll be observing uh, some social distancing and things that's required by the state, but at least a step in the right direction. And so we're thrilled about the opportunity. And Jason's got some things to share with you. And so this is more of a phase one stage. The phase one is opening the church for small groups, but also we're starting Framework at Home. We've invited some people to grab some friends and some family and to start watching service together in their homes and we'll provide questions that they can then debrief the service afterwards. They can dive deeper into the Bible. They can pray together and really experience church together in their homes. And we have that as part of our phase one. But if you're interested in starting one, inviting your own friends and family in, let us know. We'd love to know who's doing them so we can know where Framework's being held. Phase two is that we're also able to have uh, groups of 50 inside of our building. And so beginning on June 13 and 14, Saturday night, uh, different service times on Sunday, which we'll be posting at a later date, will be an opportunity for up to 50 people to meet. We'll be able to observe the same service that we're gonna be doing online, but have the opportunity to do it in person with other believers that are part of our church family. There'll also be an opportunity for Q and A afterwards, and, a time of fellowship with under the restrictions before we leave our service and a chance for you maybe to share prayer requests. We'll do some things like uh, communion together. So some opportunities, uh, observing all the protocol we need to observe, but a chance for us to have the fellowship that some of you are really craving. And I know for me, uh, just being in a small group uh, was so exciting. So looking forward to those opportunities wanted you to know and as things progress uh, in the days ahead as they begin to open up we'll be uh, letting you know we're looking forward to the day when we can operate on a more regular basis so look for more information on how we're going to be opening up on june 13th and 14th we're going to give a little more detailed description on what that will look like how to sign up even if you're interested or not or if you want to do the framework at home that's not going to stop we're going to keep going with that as well and our online services are not stopping either so we've got something for you no matter where you are how comfortable you are in the middle of this pandemic but we are excited that we get to start opening up again for those of you who are interested in joining us here at framework church and while we here at framework church have really missed you, we've been trying our best to keep you healthy and keep lowering the spread of COVID-19. But we've also missed things like doing communion together, doing prayer. And so we have a really cool opportunity for this weekend, this Sunday. Here's Pastor Victoria to explain that. Hey, Framework family, Pastor Victoria here. Wanted to let you know about an opportunity that we have this Sunday from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. right here at our Framework Centerline main campus uh, the pastors are going to be here. We want to invite you to come for a time of worship through drive-through prayer and communion. So we have got a bunch of these prepackaged communion elements, the wafers right here at the top. We've got the juice underneath. We would love to pray over you and your families. We would love to partake of the sacrament of communion with you. We'd ask that you would come in through our main entrance on center line, right to the front of the worship center door. Stay in your cars, please. We'll be there with masks and gloves, but we want to say hey, and we want to worship with you through the sacrament of communion and lift up any prayer requests that you may have. We hope to see you this Sunday from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. And so join us for communion. I'm excited about that, and I'll see you a Sunday from 12 until 2. As we get to continue to worship together and as things are morphing, whatever you're comfortable with, whether it's online, whether it's framework at home and you're meeting with a few friends and family, or whether you're going to start joining us here in the 13th and 14th, we are just blessed that we get to worship with you. And so let's join in worship right now and worship our God together.
Hey folks, welcome to our discussion this afternoon, or this morning, or this evening, whenever you're watching. Uh, it is no reality or no surprise that we are facing the reality of a lot of change in our culture right now. So many things have changed, and change really signifies loss, because we, when we change to a new reality, something's being given up. And we've been talking about that in staff meeting, realizing that the extreme changes that have gone on in our culture have led to such loss, loss of jobs, loss of income, loss of, of plans for the future, that it can lead to people experiencing grief. And so we decided that we wanted to have a conversation. This week it's going to be with the three of us. Next week it's going to be with our other three pastors. And then we're calling this conversation Good Grief. How do we grieve in the right way? How do we grieve in a way that leads to healing? And often when we think of grief, we think of the loss of a loved one, and certainly there are those who have experienced that as a result of COVID-19, but grief can impact us with other kinds of losses as well. And so what we want to do is think about the different stages of grief, and we're going to base our conversation somewhat on Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's book, Seminal Work, really, where she talks about the stages of grief. But there might be other ideas we want to bring into that, and certainly we want to look to the Scripture. And for this first conversation, we've invited Pastor Parker and Pastor Debbie to be a part of it because they uh, really are involved with our student ministries from nursery all the way up through young adults. And that's a significant part of our congregation. And children as well as teens and young adults are experiencing or are expressing their feelings as a result of the loss in different ways. And these two have encountered that firsthand, and we want to talk about that and hope to leave this conversation with some ideas of what are some things we can do to help us process through the grief in a better way. And I, I'm going to give a, a quick overview of those stages, but before I even do that, I'd like to hear a little bit from Parker and from Debbie, just asking you guys, you know, how have you ex uh, encountered the losses? What Maybe give some examples of what you've seen in your students. We'll start with you, Parker, just the way that you've seen loss and experienced that in the life of your students. Uh, yeah, I find like our students are primarily expressing the the loss of friends. Uh, in my conversation, the the most common theme that I hear our students say is, "I just miss my friends." And yeah, it's one thing to text; it's one thing to even FaceTime. Uh, but I think a lot of our middle school students, specifically, um, and more vulnerably and openly, our high school students just long to be with their friends. Um, and in recent weeks, since we're allowed to have groups of 10, uh, we're starting to see a lot of our high school students interact with their friends again. And it's almost like a, an overnight change in their attitude. Um, and so over the last couple of months, we've really seen like this sadness of I miss my people. Um, but now that they're starting to interact, their, their whole spirits have lifted. Uh, it seems as though a lot of our students are now coping better with the season that we're in. Um, but there's some real sadness that 
a lot of our students are still going through and, and experiencing loneliness through uh, the whole shutdown of schools and not being able to gather and meet with their friends and just stay at home. And uh, so that's like the common uh, expression that I find in our students is, is the sadness and the loss. You know, the one that I had thought about, and I'm sure you've encountered this, would be, I mean, what a, what a year to be a graduating senior. Right, because there's so many end of year things from prom to uh, all the activities that seniors do to graduation that they're missing out on. Have you has that been an issue that you've encountered as you've dealt with the teens? Yeah, although to be completely honest, a lot of uh, you know I have conversations with some of our students who uh, I would say are, are a little more emotionally in tune uh, with themselves and others, and and you see that. Uh, it's as if everything they've worked towards in life has been stripped away and they're they're left uh, in a word devastated um, but you know then the flip side of that coin is there's kids who uh, I don't really know if they're stopping long enough to reflect uh, but you you talk to them and you say okay how how are you feeling in regards to losing prom losing graduation baccalaureate the whole celebratory season that in we're in right now now it's may and that's where graduation events really start to ramp up and uh, a lot of them are just like yeah i'm good uh it stinks but i'm okay and uh, sometimes i wonder are you really mm -hmm. reflecting on the gravity of of the season that you're in and just you know putting a i'm good on it i don't actually think is is healthy well, and we'll we'll talk about that because that very uh, response is a form of denial, uh, which is one of the one of the stages of grief, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But Debbie, what have you seen with the children as you've been interacting with them? What I see basically is more from the parents and the children because we have a hard time to actually get together, to spend together as maybe on Zoom or stuff like that because of so many little ones. But I'm finding, and I know too, uh, just from experience that children are little and sometimes we see them as little but their fears and their angers and their anxiety is just as big as ours is and so we have to pay attention to that and I see some little kids are little social butterflies and so they're missing out on being with their friends they're missing out on birthday parties wondering why can't we do that so to kids that's a place where they're sitting and thinking I just don't understand this mom or dad can you tell me why I can't and so we really need to think on their thoughts and we really need to let them open up and speak and talk and so I guess I see mostly with kids and where summer's coming if things don't change there's a lot of places that they're used to going and so kids thoughts are why why aren't we doing this how come I can't go here how come I can't go there and I miss my friends I miss my school. This is the end of school when we're having fun. We're not doing a lot of work. We're doing fun stuff at school. So they're missing out on a lot of those areas in their life. Yeah, I think adults are feeling some of that too. Uh, maybe not school, but uh, their friends and, and family events and functions, you know, weddings and different things like that. People who have had uh, uh, death come into their family and have not been able to process the grief you know can't go to funerals or or they're very limited and so it's really affecting a lot of people yeah. and I think that's why sometimes we feel we don't have a right to grieve because it's not a death but any type of loss is a grief and and Jesus talks about that in lots of areas of his life while he was here he experienced everything we experience and doesn't say that you can't not have permission to grieve because you do and I think that's one thing we really need to realize is that grief is real in yeah. all kinds Jesus of Jesus didn't say hey get over it he said come on to me you who are heavily burdened yes he right? did so come to me and 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 with the implication is that he's going to work with us in the midst of that exactly right? so the uh, as I said we're gonna look at um, Elizabeth Kubler Ross's idea she she listed out you know um, denial was a stage of grief and anger and bargaining and depression and then acceptance and her idea wasn't that this is a linear thing you know that we, you you start with one you work your way through it and you, when you're done with that you go to the next one they can all happen at back and forth and at different times and but her her uh, contribution to this was that each of those stages of grief are not things to fix 
they're not things to that that means something's wrong with you it doesn't mean that that there's a that you're mentally ill if you're depressed or anything like that but they are necessary um, expressions that our psyche knows we need to deal with and we have to embrace them and walk through them if we're going to heal you know and so, like, take the first one. Let, let's just look at denial for a moment. You, you really mentioned that. Seniors saying, hey, I'm fine. It's, it, it's good. But denial, uh, especially when there's a, a loss of a loved one, um, and, and some, as I said, have experienced this. I know my own brother-in-law experienced the death of his brother because of COVID-19. He caught the virus and died. And part of, of denial is our psyche's ability to pace the rate at which we get hit full force with the emotions because there's all kinds of emotions associated with loss and if we, if all of those came on us at once we'd be overwhelmed so our our mind knows that we can't handle it so it actually leads us to a place of denial where we don't want to deal with it we deny that it's going on oh everything's fine and sometimes we want to tell people you know what you need to face this and deal with it but it's actually a pacing mechanism that helps us to not have to deal with it all at once right Right, and that, that's why I think, too, with, with little ones, you need to validate those, those fears because we, as parents or caretakers, we create the culture in our home. So why not have the culture of enjoying Jesus all the time? I mean, that's what in Deuteronomy 6, the Bible tells us to teach your children. Mm -hmm. So that's part Good of word. our process and our learning with our kids, teaching them, showing them. You go for a walk, tell them about creation. There's all kinds of things you can do that kids love to play. And when they began to get their feelings out, they began to get their thoughts out, then that loosens that power and that grip. And when you begin to teach them that Jesus is there all the time, not just some of the time, he's there all the time. And if we can take these thoughts and these feelings and all these things that we're not understanding, that we can say and speak them out. You don't have to tell children a whole bunch. But if you take just answer their simple question, that's all they're looking for. Yeah, is that when you, s you said validate their feelings, uh, I think that's an important word. Mm -hmm. what, what would you, how would you describe that validation process? How does a parent validate the feelings that their children are experiencing? When your child's giving you a question, something that concerns them, definitely don't laugh it off. Oh my, bring it up, talk about it. Talk about it as a family. There are questions that, oh, there's a lot of work that I have and going to be able to be put out there on the kids page. We have a kids page, and I will put that out there if anybody's interested in it. Questions that you can say yourself that bring up what a child may be feeling. So if you begin to see that they're going through different stages, and you see maybe they're not feeling so well a lot of the time, that's usually with a child that's a symptom of something's wrong. Maybe not physically sick, but something's wrong and I don't understand it. Validate that. Make sure you're looking for what your child's feeling. And I know at first everything was probably fun. We're going to be home for a while. But then as things change, listen. Take the time just to listen. Most important thing. And I think in validation, body language is important too. You yes. know, it's, it's looking people in the eye, facing them square on. Exactly. That says, I'm really concerned about you. Follow your curiosity try to, like you say, ask questions, that type of thing. Uh, Parker, in our conversation prior to we, when we started taping, we're talking a little bit about anger, you know, which is another one of those stages that people go through. And you were talking about uh, rebellion. Kind of, kind of flesh that out a little bit, some of the things you were seeing and your thoughts about that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, first, I, I want to just, like, encourage parents. Like, one of the best things you can do to validate your children is talk to them. That just got me thinking, like, why is it so important to talk to your kids about their feelings? One, like, we get to understand how they're feeling and what they're processing and thinking. Uh, but the flip side of that is, like, especially me, like, my love language is words of affirmation. And so uh, I don't feel, I feel the most validated when people engage me in conversation. Um, and I know that a lot of our kids do that too, right? Like, a, I know, uh, and you've, you've said this multiple times, like a simple phone call to to exactly. our students right. makes them feel so validated and so loved and and the same thing goes for parents like talk to your kids ask them how they're feeling uh, they may not want to be vulnerable because it's weird to talk about your feelings sometimes but uh, on the other end of it I think they'll feel very loved and very appreciated and hopefully process their emotions better uh, but 
Yeah, so when parents maybe talk to their teens, one of the responses they may get back from them is anger. And then parents sometimes are a little nervous, like they don't want to go there. That's yeah. kind of don't tread in that ground. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, especially like the teenage years, uh, like from my own personal experience, like when I handle loss or change or restrictions being put on me, which in all reality is a lot of what we've experienced in this season, um, schools are shut down. We're not allowed to meet. Now we're allowed to meet in groups of 10, but we have to wear a mask. We have to like keep six feet apart. And uh, you see a lot of people rebelling against that. And, and it's no different with teenagers. Uh, and I think it's, it's we're angry at the restrictions that are being put on our own individual freedom. Uh, and one thing in my, my position and my job is I, I see that so uh, authentically because students – especially high school kids don't really know how to damper that emotion. They're very quick to let you have it. Um, and so anger is, and like specifically rebellion is how I naturally process loss and change. So uh, in my conversations with these students who <laughs> will tell me that their parents are, are telling them not to do one thing and they're just like, yeah, I'm grounded because I outrightly disobeyed them. I'm just, I sit there and laugh because I, I think of so many times I did that in my own life as a teenager, but I ask them, okay, why? Why'd you do that? They're like, well, I want to hang out with my friends or I don't want to be six feet apart from people and, and I just don't care and I, I want to do it anyways and so I'm going to do it anyways. And I'm like, well, do you think that's like pretty prideful and, and do you think that you're doing that just because you're not going to let anybody like restrict you and confine you? And they're like, well... Yeah, and I'm like, do you think that's that's right? Like, do you think that's an appropriate way to react? And they're like, well, no. I'm like, why do you say no? And they're like, well, because I get into more trouble. So you, you bring up an interesting idea that, uh, you know, they're angry, and so they rebel. It, is is rebellion wrong, and also is anger a sin, or is, is anger sin when you rebel, or is there a way to be angry and not pa- cross over into sin? What, what do you think about that? Uh I don't think anger is a sin per se. Um, I I would say rebellion probably is sin, especially where like that's you know how sin entered the world was out of humanity's rebellion. Um, but I think it's okay to be angry, and it's okay to be very frustrated with uh, the fact that we're in this season that is you know restricting us from the life that we used to live. Uh, and a lot of it is hard. And I, sp- I think specifically for our, our high school seniors who are just very mad at really the world for taking away graduation and taking away prom and, and all of the other graduating things and um, their friends. Like, I think it's okay to be frustrated. Um, I've been very frustrated and very mad and uh, just, just angry. You know, I think that anger is a is an emotion that we it's the one that we almost default to where and and Mm -hmm. the bible says be angry and yet do not sin so you can be angry and not sin and anger is important because anger is about control it's the one emotion that we can very actively engage in and often people are feeling like they're out of control Mm -hmm. they 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 can't steer anything and so they will be angry at the world they'll be angry at god they'll be angry at their parents they'll be angry at people that really don't have anything to do with the real source of their anger because they're trying to control something so it's it's actually an emotion that's important for them to embrace if they're going to work through the stuff that's going on but how do they and i may throw this out to both of you how does a child or a, a teen engage with anger without stepping over the line into rebellion or sin mm-hmm. like what can they do how do they process anger in a positive way i think i again i come back to debbie's point of parents talking to their children and their teenagers um like i mean anger can be expressed in so many different ways um it, it can just come across as as a lot of short sharp attitudes uh, and, and with teenagers, that is very common. So <laughs> it uh, goes back and forth all the time for many different reasons. But uh, like talking to your children and talking to your students is is vital. But at the same time, more importantly, I would say teaching them to express it in prayer. Um, we've been we do youth group through Zoom on Sunday nights, and one of the things that we've been looking at the last three or four weeks has been prayer and. 
last week specifically, uh, we looked at sitting in the presence of God, venting our emotion, both good and bad. And that's been almost a game changer and a lifesaver in this season for myself. And that's part of the reason why I share that with students. And, and I started asking them, like, why do we not go to God and, and in a word, lament, um, express our feelings? And a lot of times it's because of the misconception that prayer is by nature and structure. We, we're asking God for things. But that's that's not what the New Testament writer like Paul, when he says, uh, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. Uh, that's he's not ask, not telling us to, to tell, uh, ask God for stuff consistently. He's talking about sitting in the presence of God and and putting before our emotions and our concerns and our worries. Um, and so that was actually a challenge I gave our students last week was to spend um, an hour this week, break it up into two 30 minute blocks, uh, eliminate all external distractions. So go to your room, be by yourself. Don't bring your cell phone in. Don't have electronics. Just get rid of all the distractions and sit there and, and ask yourself these, this one question and, and talk to God with this other question saying, I'm entering the presence of God. I'm entering the presence of God. Holy Spirit, I would like you to speak to me in this moment. And then here's how I'm feeling. And as you begin to do that, that takes your eyes off yourself. Right. And puts them on God. Right. And so that takes that selfish part a little bit to the side. Um, with kids, kids are going to do what you do. Kids follow what their parents do. And so what are you doing right now to help yourself? Because we're all in this boat, just like our teenagers and our kids are. We're, we're all there. And so what are we doing? Are we taking time to get into the word? Are we taking time to pray? Are we taking time to see God so, in yeah, creation? So, okay, so if I, get, if I get alone with God, let me grab my little nose here, sorry. <laughs> if I get alone with God and I like say, you know, all right, here's how I'm feeling. And then I like tell God off or I'm like, I like, like spew and get really mad and express my anger to God. Is that okay to do that? Yeah. It, it I really is. believe it is okay. because I believe God wants to know your feelings. He wants to Amen. know what you're feeling. He Amen. wants to see what Don't you're you feeling. Think he already knows them. Uh, he does, yeah. but come you, on, it's yeah, your right. place to say, "This is where I am, God, and this is what I feel yeah. like, and this is what is happening." Right. I remember when we went, and and again, this one is death. But when we went through death, mm. I had to express my feelings yep. to God in order for me to get over that bit of hump. So whatever you've lost through this, yeah. you've can't think it's just me right. no you've lost something let god know you've lost it yeah. and then right so take his word so god knows you're feeling it so really telling him about it isn't for his benefit it's really for it's yours. for your own and he, exactly. he yeah. wants you to get that healing you know and yeah. i really i think our, our time is about up but yeah. um and we didn't even get to the other stages and that's okay the other team will probably cover some of that but i think part of the important thing in this is creating safe spaces where people can have honest conversations. You know, in the church, we just sometimes make people feel bad about expressing real emotions, raw emotions. And the church needs to be a place where it can be safe, exactly. to be honest and transparent. And in the family, that needs to be the case as well. And there's yep. also this issue of pacing. We got to give people time. There is no prescribed time, like you're in this stage for this many days, now you ought to be over it. It doesn't work that way. You know, that's why the Bible in the psalmist said, search me, O God, and know my heart and see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And that, that statement, lead me in the way, is about lead me in the path. And that speaks of a process. It speaks of time, giving people time to work through it. So what I'm hearing you two say over and over again, and really the, the answer is simple, not easy, but simple, that we create a safe space for somebody and give the time that they need to let them talk and let them process so that they can work through the emotions that they're feeling and and the other emotions the same way whether it's depression or bargaining or yeah. anything like that we've got well and i think time. the the key to knowing if you've created a safe place is vulnerability mm. uh, one of the one of the people that i read a lot of her work in preparation for this and have always really enjoyed what she has to say is Brene Brown. And I mean, she's pretty much done uh, her entire career on, on vulnerability and pain and loss and, and grief uh, and, and this sort of stuff. And, and there's a, a TED talk that I was watching and she talked about how like healing and 
um, restoration never actually happens until we enter a place of vulnerability Mm -hmm. until those walls and those guards of our emotional um, restriction is let down and we can let our feelings and our emotions out that is where healing and and getting over grief happens and i think that that's why like the psalmist write that down and it's been thousands of years that we've we've known this god's known this he's taught us this but human nature i think wants us to to restrict and restrain and then grief presents itself in different ways and and that's where healing comes in a safe place is through vulnerability yeah yeah being able to say to god you know what i'm a wet mess hot mess and god is okay with that he knows that um, all right, thanks, guys. This is so informative. Okay, can I really leave you good. with just a, an example you, you real quick? You leave us with an example, <laughs> and then we're going to say a word of prayer. I heard this example on Dr. Jeremiah just a couple weeks ago, and I thought, how amazing. Um, uh, Dr. Burnhouse was his name, Barnhouse, and he was actually a doctor or a pastor in Philadelphia, and his wife had passed away. He had his children, and they were just returning home from the funeral. And so on his way, he was thinking, I need some way to comfort my children. And so as soon as he was thinking that, this huge truck was going by them. And as it was, it was a huge shadow. And he said to the kids, he said, kids, what would you rather have? Would you rather have this truck run over you physically, or would you rather have the shadow run over us? And they said, well, of course, Dad, the shadow, because that way it's not going to hurt. And he said, that's what Jesus did over 2,000 years ago. A truck of death or grief, whatever you're facing, ran over him so that we can just be in the shadow of it. Yeah. And I thought that was so amazing. That sounds like, yea, though I walk through the valley of yes, the shadow that's exactly of death, where it comes from. I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your He's staff. already done it good. for us. That's yeah. really good. Hey, let's pray together, can we? Dear God, we thank you that uh, you took on the reality and the substance of the pain so that we just experienced the shadow. And like um, Paul, we say, oh, death, where is your sting? And we thank you for the promise of resurrection. Now, Lord, I pray that you would give us uh, presence of mind and the ability as parents and leaders in the lives of our children and teens to create safe spaces. We have margin. Help us to use that margin of time and, uh, and sheltering to create safe spaces where our kids can process. Give us the courage to wade into raw emotions with our family in ways that are positive and ways that are healthy so that as we embrace these things we're feeling, you can do that work in us that you promised to do, and you can lead us in the way everlasting. Let that be a reality in our church mm-hmm. and in our families and in our homes. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, God bless you. Thanks for joining us.